Thank you very much. And we turn to our next item of business, which is topical questions. And our first question from Rachel Hamilton. Rachel Hamilton. Oh, there. To ask the Scottish Government what its forecast is for income tax growth in the coming years. Cabinet Secretary Derek Mackay. The Scottish Government does not produce its own income tax forecast. The Independent Scottish Fiscal Commission it published their official forecast of Scottish income tax receipts twice per year, have done so since December 2017. The SFC forecast annual income tax receipts of £11.5 billion in 2018-19, growing to £14.6 billion in 2024-25, which is an increase of £3.1 billion. Rachel Hamilton. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. Scotland collects its own income tax, meaning that it is more independent on its, of its own economic performance. The IPPR suggests that if tax projections are correct, the Scottish economy could lose £1.8 over the next five years through weaker income tax growth compared with the rest of the United Kingdom. Despite £360 million of income tax rises in 1920, Increased income tax growth in the rest of the UK means the Scottish Government's budget will be £5 million worse off than it would be under the previous system. Without hiding behind a Brexit bushel, can the Cabinet Secretary tell the Chamber how the Scottish Government will fill the tank of an economy running on empty? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, there are a number of issues in there. First of all, Scotland's <coughs> economy is performing well in terms of record low unemployment, record high employment, uh, strong performance on productivity, exports and a number of other economic indicators. There is uh, an issue certainly around what might be cyclical or distributional issues in terms of income tax uh, growth. And by that, and I've studied this uh, thoroughly at the uh, Finance Committee, where there might well be deepening inequality in the rest of the United Kingdom where more higher rate taxpayers' increases are going further, and that distributional, that cyclical, that um, deepening inequality may well have a negative impact uh, on Scotland's income tax rates, net because of the arrangements in the fiscal um, framework. But if our economy is growing strongly, and of course we want to support that ongoing economic growth, yes, uh, avert Brexit because it will have a damaging impact for the whole of the UK uh, and for Scotland, uh, we, but we do want to see that uh, sustainable growth uh, agenda. Uh, but I would want to point out that the benefit of having a devolved income tax system is that we can make decisions for ourselves, such as having a more progressive income tax system, therefore one that sees 55% of Scottish taxpayers paying less than they would have done if they lived south of the border. And that's 55% at the lower end of the income distribution rather at the top end, who the Conservatives seem to want to pander to. Rachel Hamilton. Again, I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. The SFC and Fraser of Allender have noted that Scotland's net tax position is worse because of the downward revisions to Scottish earnings growth, despite the fact that Scottish taxpayers are paying 500 million more in income tax uh, compared to their counterparts in the rest of the UK. Does this mean that the Cabinet Secretary will have no choice but to increase taxes further, leading to less money in hardworking Scots pockets, less growth, less revenue, ultimately leading Scotland further into the black hole? <laughs> it doesn't mean that at all. And the SFC reconciliation, yes, really, uh, the income tax reconciliation numbers, the income tax reconciliation is down to forecast error at the hands of the Scottish Fiscal Commission and the OBR. Uh, and, and that's the reality of the income tax reconciliation. Um, that is the issue that will be addressed in terms of those reconciliations, which at the moment are still forecast, forecast on forecast. Once we've got outturn data, we'll know exactly what position is. And then, yes, we can more deeply understand this issue, which might be distributional, about the potential of a higher rate taxpayers' growth in the rest of the United Kingdom compared to Scotland. But factual point, income tax is going up year on year. We'll be collecting more uh, in income tax, uh, but because of the block grant uh, adjustment and UK rates potentially going up more, that's some of the issues that's been um, addressed by the SFC. So the truth is that the Scottish economy is doing well, the economic indicators are strong, income tax will be going up. Of course, we want to further stimulate that growth, but it is put at threat. That's what the Fiscal Commission report says, and Fraser of Allender Institute, our economic success story is under threat as a consequence of Brexit, which can still be averted. And in relation to taxpayers, because that's partly what the question 
it was about. We have a more progressive tax system in Scotland. The structure is fairer. The decisions we've taken are fairer as well. But if, for example, there's a Boris Johnson premiership, then it's perfectly clear that the funding will go towards tax cut for the richest 10% in society. That is unfair. That will continue austerity. And there's not the kind of choices that the Scottish Government uh, will be making, because it's not the choice of the Scottish people. There are there are three members who wish to ask a supplementary on this, so I hope they will all be quite uh, succinct. James Kelly to be followed by Tom Arthur. James Kelly. Thank you, Presiding Officer. One of the points the IPPR makes to boost tax revenue is to promote uh, wage growth. An increase of 1% in wages would uh, add £750 million to tax revenues. And that's particularly relevant when there are 470,000 people in Scotland not being paid the living wage. So can I ask the Cabinet Secretary, is now not the time for the Scottish Government to change procurement legislation to make it mandatory that anyone working on a public contract is paid at least the living wage? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, we are working within the law to try and ensure that as many people are paid the living wage as possible. And I get advice to say what's legal and what's illegal. And we're absolutely doing everything we can within the law uh, to support the living wage. That's why I think it's good news that more people are paid the living wage in Scotland than any other part of the United Kingdom. But everyone should, of course, be paid at least that. Uh, we have a real focus on the living wage and the fair work agenda. And actually, uh, in tackling inequality is really important here. That's one of the issues that's driving the reports that we're hearing about. Inequality is getting deeper and greater in the rest of the United Kingdom. And that's having an impact, i.e. those at the top are being paid more disproportionately more as we are trying to bring those at the bottom of the structure up. So I absolutely agree uh, on um, that minimal level. It would be better, of course, if we had uh, devolution and control and power over employment law and over setting the minimum wage in Scotland. But in the absence of that authority and those powers, we'll do everything we can as a government to encourage payment of the living wage from those who we procure services from and, of course, more widely than that. Tom Arthur to be followed by Patrick Harvey. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Central to the operation of the fiscal framework is relative economic performance between Scotland and the rest of the UK. And a key driver of both wage growth and income tax receipts is productivity. Can the Cabinet Secretary therefore outline how Scottish productivity growth compares with that of the rest of the UK? Cabinet Secretary. Well, specifically, the latest statistics show that in 2018, Scotland's productivity grew by 3.8% compared to the 0.5% in the UK as a whole. And furthermore, since 2007, productivity in Scotland has grown 10.8% compared to 2.7% in the UK. Patrick Harvey. Thank you. All governments face some degree of uncertainty from fiscal forecasting because there's always going to be a risk of forecasting errors. But the Scottish position is now that we have forecasts both from the Scottish Fiscal Commission and the OBR, two separate sets of fiscal forecasts done by separate bodies with separate methodologies. Isn't it increasingly clear that the absurdly complex fiscal framework has left Scotland with compounded economic uncertainty in exchange for half measures on fiscal autonomy? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I think that is a good description of the complexity of the, the, the system, and there's an easy remedy to the complexity of devolution, and that's Scottish independence. Question number two, Mary Fee. To ask the Scottish Government what its response is to reports that children and young people who attempt to take their own lives have to wait weeks for specialist mental health support. Minister Clare Hockey. The Scottish Government is committed to ensuring that children and young people get access to the mental health support they need and recognises the distress caused to children, young people and their families by any delay in accessing mental health support. Children and young people are a particular focus in the Suicide Prevention Action Plan published in August 2018. A National Suicide Prevention Leadership Group has been established by myself, chaired by the former DCC, Rose Fitzpatrick, and the membership is broad, including representation from health and social care, justice, third sector, local authorities and COSLA, as well as clinical professionals, importantly young people, and people whose lives have been affected by suicide. And the Scottish Government is working with the NSPLG to ensure that all the actions of the Suicide Prevention Action Plan consider the needs of children and young people. Mary Fee. In June last year, the government tried to sneak out the audit report on rejected CAMS referrals, 
which found a belief amongst patients that unless the situation was serious enough, the individual would not be seen. Nine months ago, Audit Scotland published a report on CAMS, which found that young people were not getting appropriate care until they reached crisis point. This weekend, it was reported that a teenager who had already tried to take her own life had to wait a further four weeks to be seen. Given the seriousness and the urgency of the situation, does that sound like adequate progress to the Minister? Minister. Well, um, I thank Mary Fee for, for her follow-up question. The long waits for CAMS treatment and support are unacceptable, and that's why we set out in the 2018 programme for government a £250 million package of measures to support positive mental health and prevent mental ill health. We also formed the Children and Young People's Task Force, um, whose uh, delivery plan um, was published at the start of or at the end of December, and who will be publishing their recommendations on how mental health services can be improved for children and young people and their families next month. Mary Fee. Can I thank the Minister for um, that answer? However, um, it doesn't sound like much progress has been made to me and I'm sure to many people that are listening to this. One in four children and young people are still having to wait over four months to be seen for the first appointment. And last month, during the statement on the NHS Tayside interim report, the Minister refuted a suggestion from Miles Briggs that the issue of services not taking suicidal patients seriously was widespread across the country. <coughs> Given the reports over the weekend, does the Minister stand by that statement? And after a full year in the job, is she really so unaware of the issues on the ground? Minister. Uh, thank Mary Fee for that answer, uh, for that question again. Um, at the end of March, 26,740 children and young people were under the care of CAM services across Scotland. I think that's, a, that's testament to the amount of work that the uh, CAMS uh, staff do in terms of supporting children and young people at a time when they are feeling particularly vulnerable. But there is much more for us to do and that's why I'm looking forward to the recommendations from the Children and Young People's Task Force and working with COSLA to set about how we address those recommendations. Um, and I'm sure that the, uh, the um, response to that will be something that Mary Fee will be interested interested in hearing when we make a statement in uh, September about the progress of the mental health strategy. Annie Wells. Thank you. Figures released in May show the Scottish Government is falling woefully short of getting anywhere near its mental health workers target. Despite a promise in the mental health strategy to recruit 800 additional workers by 2021-22, as of April this year just 186 whole time equivalents had been recruited. Can the Minister guarantee today that it will meet this target? Minister. Um, thank Annie Wells for that question. Um, we are uh, reporting quarterly on the uh, additional workers under Action 15 of the mental health strategy. Um, the last figures were published in May, so there will be further figures published in uh, August time. Um, and we're certainly keeping close track. We are working hard with our uh, colleagues in health boards and integrated joint boards to ensure that we get the workers in those, uh, those key target areas as uh, quickly and as appropriately as we can do. Thank you very much. Question number three, Alex Cole Hamilton. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government how it will reduce the reported long waits for inpatient and day case uh, dental treatment. Minister Joe Fitzpatrick. Our £850 million waiting times improvement plan will substantially and sustainably improve waiting times, including inpatient and day case dental treatment. Alex Cole Hamilton. I thank the Minister for that answer. Across Scotland, dental consultant vacancies are going unfilled and patients are left waiting. The British Dental Association described the figures acquired by SPICE and the Scottish Liberal Democrats as eye-watering, and they said patients can effectively expect to wait much longer. The BDA said these long waits are being driven by a failure on prevention and a failure to invest in the workforce. The most recent ISD figures show, quote, a noticeable drop in NHS dental staff, down 14.7% in the last five years alone. Can the Minister explain why? Minister. The, there was two points made in the BDA. So one was workforce, which I'll come to shortly, but the other was prevention. And I, and I do think 
start prevention is an area where we are making substantial success um, across Scotland. So the Child Smile programme um, is, is making a real difference, so helping make sure that um, children know how to brush their teeth properly, providing fluoride varnish applications. And, um, the, the next stage in that um, we'll be announcing under the Community Challenge Fund of the Oral Health Improvement Plan um, will be announcing um, which projects, bespoke projects, will be taken forward to aim at uh, reducing uh, further the health inequalities in children in terms of their oral health. In terms of um, the, the other area, one, one of the, the big challenges around um, our, our well, well for, first of all, one of the challenges we no longer have in terms of dentists is that now there's been, a, there's very few people who can't access a, an NHS dentist. So when we took over in, in 2007 as a government, the huge numbers of people unable to access um, an NHS dentist, and we've really managed to turn that around. So, you know, some, sometimes I think it's important to, to say you know, where, where progress has been made, and so I think we should um, raise some um, acknowledgement of the progress and thank our dental colleagues um, for, for ri rising to, to the challenge and making sure that people can, in, in the first place, access um, NHS dental practices. In terms of some of the specialist areas, one of the, the big areas, I had a, a chat with uh, the BDA just last week, and one of the, the, the challenging areas is around anaesthetic consultants, and, and, and that leads to a number of, of the, the waiting times. Um, but even there, we can see that we have managed to increase the numbers of anaesthetic consultants by 41.7% since 2006. So that's moving from 549 up to 778. Um, I'm, I'm in no way suggesting that I think everything is rosy and I, I do accept that some of the weights that we, we know about, in particular some of the more challenging cases are, are, are entirely unacceptable and particularly when we're talking about um, children who are, who are often in, in pain, we, we need to continue to, to do better around that. But I think we are managing to, to, to make a difference and the Waiting Times Improvement Plan is designed to make that even better. Alex Crawl-Hamilton. I'm grateful to the Minister for that answer. I have a constituent who requires both inpatient and day case support, but she isn't getting any treatment whatsoever. In 1995, Angela Mulhern fell victim to William John Duff. He performed a series of unnecessary and incompetent dental surgical procedures, which have caused tens of thousands of pounds worth of damage to her teeth and jawbone and left her in constant pain. Ms Mulhern underwent this treatment as an NHS patient, yet has not had the necessary remedial work carried out or even offered by the Scottish NHS. Will the Minister agree to meet with Mr Mulhern and I? Minister. I, I think if in, in the first instance, if Mr Cole Hamilton wants to write me about a case which I have absolutely no awareness of um, right now, then we can discuss how we should take that forward. Yeah. I'm quite, we've got four members who wish to ask supplementaries, but I'm just conscious we've got such little time this afternoon, so I'm afraid I'm going to be very harsh not to take any of the members uh, and just encourage them to put in written questions and apologies to Monica Lennon, Miles Briggs, James Dornan and Neil Findlay. And we are going to move on now to the next item of business. In fact, we're just uh, a short suspension, not a suspension, we're just going to take a pause while we move on to the next item of business.